YouTube wants everyone to make more YouTube Shorts videos. Well, I'm a team player, so Philosophy Shorts Denim and Descartes Edition. Let's, uh, let's talk about Descartes. This here is Descartes' Discourse on Method and Meditations on First Philosophy, a wonderful book, rather wonderful two books. I don't think that in this video I will spend much time talking about the book itself, uh, the books themselves, and go into any detail about what's in the text. Rather, I'm going to mainly try to introduce uh, the background, the backstory. What, what made Descartes happen? More generally, what made modern philosophy happen? Modern philosophy is largely an attempt to start over, but starting over always has a backstory. Uh, think of any, any story about starting over there's always some kind of backstory behind it. So we want to get a uh, working understanding of the backstory behind Descartes, and, uh, and that helps to put the book itself in perspective. As for the book itself, well, I've gone over it before, once or twice, uh, at least the discourse on method, and I should do more in future. I sure hope I will. We'll worry about that in the future. So, the discourse on method, I believe, is published in 1635. And there was some interesting commentary, um, criticism, discussion around the book, and in particular around the method of doubt. I think this is described in the Meditations on First Philosophy, the, the preface Descartes writes, or the, uh, shall we call it, the introductory letter to those most wise and distinguished men, the dean and doctors of the Faculty of Sacred Theology of Paris, where he says the discourse on method having been published and having uh, elicited some discussion, about the method of doubt in part three of the discourse, um, Descartes decided to do another book zooming in on that material. So in, in part three of the discourse on method published in 1635, Descartes talks about how he um, used doubt to find the one thing that could not be doubted, namely his own existence. I think therefore I am cogito ergo sum. And then he used uh, his knowledge of his own existence to uh, rebuild a new structure of knowledge and find out what we can know and get on with the knowing of it so then we can go on and know other things and in general proceed with the business of learning stuff and using that knowledge usefully that was the point of the discourse on method but the method of doubt stuff the i think therefore i am and the next few stages of his process of reconstructing a new system of knowledge on that foundation cogito ergo sum that had elicited some discussion and criticism which led to the Meditations on First Philosophy that really zooms in on that method. Okay, so that's, uh, that's quite enough introduction for this video to that book as such. Now let's, let's talk about the backstory. Why did this happen? So, 1635. What happened? Um, I was checking the math and I was getting 118 years earlier. What happened 118 years before 1635? Oh, silly me. 1637 discourse on method. What happened 100 and, I'm getting the math right, 120 years before that? I'm thinking 1517, if I'm getting that date right as well. Martin Luther nails the uh, 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg. So, the Reformation has had about 120 years. That's part of the backstory. There are three things I want to talk about with the backstory of, uh, the backstory to Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy and Discourse on Method. Three historical and cultural and philosophical and to some extent theological developments that made Descartes' philosophy, uh, that made it happen, that made Descartes think he needed to start over in philosophy. So the three things I want to talk about, and help to explain that, I want to talk about what is the historical development and what did modern philosophy do in response to it and what did Descartes do uh, specifically. So that's actually nine things. Um, Three things, the first of which is the Reformation, and how modern philosophy responded to each of these three things, or why each of these three things uh, posed a problem for modern philosophy to try and solve, and then three, how does Descartes exemplify this attempted solution? All right, Reformation. What sort of problem does this pose for the philosophers to solve, primarily the epistemological problem of overconfidence in our belief? At least I think that's maybe oversimplified, but I think that's what uh, is central here. Okay, so understand that as a result of the Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation, there's a lot of turmoil in, well, what word do we use? Europe, Christendom, there's a lot of turmoil in the Christian world, at least the Western Christian world. Maybe things are a little different uh, out in the, the Eastern Orthodox churches. Uh, 
Ethiopian Orthodox, and so on. The Martoma Church in India, things were different. But in the Western Christian world, there's a lot of turmoil. There were religious wars. Now, I don't want to oversimplify things. I think every one of these religious wars, as we might think of them, had an economic aspect and a political aspect and a cultural aspect. I won't say there would never have been a war uh, if, it had, if there had been none of these other things, there would have been just religion. Well, never say, I won't say there would have been a war. I won't say there never would have either. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the history well enough. But there were wars that had a religious aspect in Europe. And there's persecution of one Christian by another. Catholics persecute Protestants, sometimes vice versa. In fact, some Protestants were persecuted by Catholics and by other Protestants. There's a wonderful book, also green, by um, William Estep. 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 I'm going to go with Estep. William Estep. Um, the book is called The Anabaptist Story. A wonderful book. So... The Anabaptist wing of the Reformation sometimes suffered persecution at the hands of other Protestants as well. The, the Hutterites were um, mercilessly persecuted by everybody. The world was not worthy of them. And in Hebrews 11 terminology, they were driven out of society. They were driven into forests for a while. Eventually, the surviving Hutterites found a home in, in the Americas. Uh, I won't promise you it wasn't Brazil. My, my brain tells me maybe it was Brazil, but I'm almost certain it was Pennsylvania, though it may also have been Brazil. I don't remember. It's in that book, The Anabaptist Story by William Estep. Lovely book. All right, so there's a lot of this. People are burned at the stake for having the wrong theology. People are drowned, I think, in some cases. There are um, Protestant countries and Catholic countries. I think England went back and forth a few times, right? So there's religious turmoil, there's religious persecution, and the Early modern philosophers are thinking, hey, we've got people who are really confident of their beliefs, and then we've got people on the other side who are really confident of their beliefs, and they're killing each other. Maybe there's a better way. Hmm? Maybe we could uh, first figure out what knowledge is, and then get it, and then use it to persuade each other, and then no one has to get burned at the stake for having the wrong theology on baptism. Now, I'm sure this is an oversimplification. Fine, uh, it happens. But this is, this is part of what's going on. This is the epistemological problem. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. This is part of the epistemological situation that inspires the early modern philosophers to look for a solution, to look for a better way of first getting knowledge and then well, first figuring out what knowledge is and how to get it and then getting it and then hopefully being able to do what we need with it, live by it, persuade others of it without needing to burn anyone at the stake. So the modern philosophers, that's the Reformation and the problem it posed, uh, the situation it caused, Reformation and Counter-Reformation, and the modern response, uh, the modern philosophy response is to focus on knowledge and put some real work into finding out what is the be best method for gaining knowledge. This is the discourse on method. Uh, Descartes is trying to figure out what is the best method for gaining knowledge, and he is thereby exemplifying the modern philosophical quest for the right method for gaining knowledge. Modern philosophy privileges epistemology as the first branch of philosophy, not metaphysics, not the other stuff. Hmm. Now, first philosophy, I think when Descartes says meditation on first philosophy, he's actually referring to metaphysics. But I think we can safely interpret, perhaps oversimplifying, but we can still reasonably with some oversimplification, interpret the early modern philosophy era as an era in which a focus on what is knowledge and how do we get it on epistemology became the fundamental branch of philosophy. Now, Descartes exemplifies this in these books. He exemplifies it, above all, in his method of doubt. This is the new way of getting knowledge. But there's a lot of other epistemology which maybe could be discussed at another time. Now, that's one thing, the Reformation. The situation it created, or the, the problem it posed, the epistemological situation, and what the modern philosophers did in response, and specifically what Descartes does. So now, let's do another thing. Okay, so first is the Reformation. I think we'll save uh, the science one for last. So in between, we can do this one that maybe we can do kind of quickly. Scholastic medieval philosophy. Now, eh, some things depend on how you define your terms. I prefer not to define scholastic medieval philosophy as beginning with Aquinas. I think of it as late medieval, later than Aquinas, late medieval Catholic philosophy after Aquinas. I think of the major scholastic philosophers as John Duns Scotus and William of Ockham. So that's the guy we get the term Ockham's razor from. 
So um, Scotus and Occam are scholastic medieval philosophers. Scholastic philosophy is late medieval philosophy, and it's pretty Catholic. It's very Catholic. And it's very... Um, I have a list of words I try to use, hoping to uh, paint the right sort of picture by using all of them. It's abstruse. It's arcane. It's esoteric. It's brilliant. It's lofty. It's maybe not that easy to follow. I well remember the joy and the challenge of getting through my comps readings in grad school in um, Occam and Scotus. Uh, I got through those readings with a combination of malt meal, porridge, and tea, and Rogue Squadron on Nintendo 64. And I put lots of honey in the porridge. I needed the energy. So, wonderful philosophy in some respects, but it sure looks kind of useless. It's brilliant, but it's not very closely connected to everyday life. It doesn't seem practical. That's the, the worry these, these modern philosophers have with scholasticism. So, again, I'm perhaps oversimplifying a bit. You know, Descartes will maybe have any number of metaphysical or epistemological concerns with scholasticism. If we have more time, I bet I could point to one or two of those. But the moral imperative the modern philosophers find, which is in part in response to scholasticism, is that they want to make philosophy useful again. Philosophy was really useful. It was always meant to be useful, and possibly it always was. Possibly even the scholastics were useful in ways most of us have difficulty understanding. Consult, if you can find the right person, a really good scholar of Occam and Scotus, and ask, what's the use of all this? And you might get a really interesting answer. I don't want to oversimplify. I do want to, however, give the simplified picture, mentioning that there may be more to the whole story, this is not the whole story. This is perhaps a simplified picture, but it does help to explain part of what's going on and why Descartes happened, why this amazing philosophy happened. So the scholastic philosophy is brilliant, but it is not closely connected to ordinary, everyday life. Understand that the, the bubonic plague had eliminated something like one-third, maybe a half, I think I've seen estimates uh, from uh, at least in that range, of the population of Europe. It had killed a lot of people. There's a wonderful book called Eiffelheim by, I believe, Michael Flynn. It's actually a great science fiction book. Aliens show up on Earth, extraterrestrials, and it's in medieval Europe, you know. It's not modern day, and they're trying to destroy Shanghai or Washington, D.C. No, it's medieval Europe. It's a wonderful premise for a book. Eiffelheim by Michael Flynn. Lovely book. The bubonic plague is happening in this book. Spoiler alert, not everyone escapes. And Occam turns up. William of Occam has a cameo in Eiffelheim. And so here's one of Europe's greatest minds. And what's he doing? Well, he's not fixing bubonic plague is what he's not doing. They hadn't even figured out the rats were involved. So bubonic plague happens while the greatest minds are doing scholastic philosophy. What's up with that? Surely they could do something more useful. Uh, here's an example of scholastic philosophy being brilliant and kind of interesting, but not obviously practical. I'm now thinking of my teacup. My thought is a reference to the teacup, but now, now I'm thinking about dragons. And dragons probably don't actually exist, unfortunately. So my thought now of dragons is not referencing any actual dragons. It's not connecting to them. It's not... Uh, denoting any beings that actually exist, in all likelihood, unfortunately. But now when I'm thinking of the teacup, my thought is referencing, denoting, pointing to, I don't know what words to use, any number might work. It's not the time to talk about this in any kind of detail. What is the right way to describe this? Right now when I'm thinking of my teacup, my thought connects to the actual thing that exists, the teacup, unlike when I'm thinking about dragons right now. So scholastic philosophers actually ask this. What's the metaphysical status of my thoughts of things that don't actually exist? I actually find that question kind of interesting. I read them tackling it in my comps exams. So, interesting philosophy, brilliant philosophy, but not obviously useful. I mean, I have no idea what to do with that, uh, the answer to that question if I had it. So, uh, I once, for students, went online and found a Trumpy hat generator. And I made it say, Make philosophy useful again. That's what the modern philosophers want to do in response to scholasticism. So now, how does Descartes exemplify this? Well, book six of the Discourse on Method. Descartes talks about um, his ignorance 
in, I guess I should say part six. In part one of the Discourse on Method, he talks about his ignorance. Part two, he talks about uh, what is knowledge and what's my plan for getting it, more or less, oversimplifying a bit. Part three, he launches his method of doubt. I'm so sorry. It's part four. The method of doubt is part four. Bad job, Mark. The method of doubt is part four. He uh, talks about his plan for getting knowledge and provisional rules for life until he can in part three. And then in part four, not part three, he does his method of doubt. And then in part five, he talks about well, what we now call Cartesian dualism. He talks about how, based on his method of doubt, he figured out uh, how the universe is divided into mind and matter. And then in part six, he says, I am able to establish science on the foundation of knowledge I've already built. And now that we've established science, let's go do it. And let's use science to invent a lot of cool things that can fix the world up, including no more bubonic plague. Descartes' agenda for making philosophy useful again is his epistemology and his metaphysics will be the foundation for science. And then we can use science to fix up the world and not have to worry about bubonic plague and other things. He wants to cure disease, uh, eliminate the, the maladies of old age, and come up with an infinity of devices to make the world useful. Uh, sorry, an infinity, of, an infinity of devices to make the world a better place. He says we can make ourselves uh, the masters and possessors of nature in this, uh, by these means. We can't fix death. He seems pretty clear that we cannot fix death, but we can fix just about everything else with the right sort of science. So now we have polio vaccines. You can take Descartes for that. Make philosophy useful again is what the modern philosophers want to do in response to the brilliance and yet perceived uselessness of scholasticism. And that's how Descartes does it with uh, his program for science in part six, also very similar to Francis Bacon's program for science. Knowledge is power, says Bacon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Yeah, I'm quoting Bacon out of context. Bacon does do that with science. He has the same agenda or a very closely related agenda to Descartes. But I shouldn't quote knowledge is power without reviewing the context. So never mind the quote. Bacon, Francis Bacon, uh, does have the same agenda for science as Descartes. All right. Third thing's going to be a little harder. You could get a very simple version of it. You might be mostly okay, but let's, let's not do a very simple version. First thing was Reformation, Counter-Reformation. Pros an epistemological problem. The philosophers in the modern era want to fix that problem by uh, figuring out what knowledge is and getting it. Uh, figuring out what knowledge is, how we can get it, and then getting it, and then not having these other problems where our confidence in our beliefs seems to exceed our religious beliefs and people get burned at the stake for beliefs that maybe we shouldn't be so confident in, or maybe at least we can persuade each other over if we can figure out knowledge rather than killing each other over them. So that's one. And then the uh, second one was scholastic philosophy, which is freaking brilliant, but seems kind of useless. And so the philosophers want to make philosophy useful again, and Descartes will do so by, uh, with his scientific agenda, right? So the third one is modern science. The third reason modern philosophy happened was that modern science was just starting. You can connect this, if you like, to the Renaissance. I think there's definitely a connection to the Renaissance. The existence of Galileo, <laughs> by all by itself, probably provides some support for that. Now, I, I won't say it's just the Renaissance. Uh, I've read sources saying it was Islam that made modern science happen, and it was the Reformation that made modern science happen. I haven't studied the history of science enough to, to mediate this dispute. Uh, there may be some truth to all uh, three theories. I think the Renaissance had something to do with it, but anyway... Descartes lives at the time of Galileo. Now, Galileo got in some trouble with the Catholic Church, which uh, disturbed Descartes. He got scared. You can find this in, uh, in these very texts, where he talks about how he had um, planned to write a particular book, and then Galileo happened, and he got scared and didn't write the whole book. He wrote something else. He wrote part six of the Discourse on Method, it would seem. Okay, so... You could go online and see if you can find Gerald Bray's, B-R-A-Y, if I remember correctly, Gerald Bray's Lectures on Church History. He explains what the real problem was with Galileo. It wasn't so much that Galileo was, um, uh, Galileo was saying that the earth revolves around the sun and not vice versa, and therefore that was, that was a problem because Catholic theology was wedded to this particular uh, theory in, in cosmology. It wasn't so much that 
he had a different astronomy. The bigger issue was that he was challenging the authority of Aristotle. Um, that's a thing. Uh, go find Gerald Bray's lectures on church history, see if you can figure that out if you like. But let me tell you something else about Galileo. But first, let me give you a couple of uh, preliminary ways you can think of this that are maybe not quite right, but steps in the right direction. So the new science poses a problem for the old religion and the old ethics. Now, you might be thinking, in very simplified terms, there's a conflict between science and religion, and it's just starting now in the early modern era, and so the early modern philosophers want to solve that conflict in favor of religion or in favor of science, or more likely both, by integrating them somehow or separating them. Science can go play over here, and religion can go play over here on different sides of the, the playground that is the world. Science can have... Science can have matter and religion can have souls or something like that. Actually, Descartes' uh, dualism does sort of look a lot like that. But uh, this is, well, I won't say it's simply wrong. that the, There's a conflict between science and religion that's emerging in the early modern era, and the modern philosophers want to fix it so we can um, keep our old religion and still have some science too, or something like that. And you're not wrong if you think in these terms. Uh, not strictly wrong. I'll just say it's a little oversimplified. Here's some other terms you could think in, and this is, again, maybe not the whole truth, but yeah, it's close enough. It's a pretty good approximation. Uh, it, gets, it gets at some of the relevant ideas fairly well. Science. It's analyzing things without reference to free will. We think we have free will, and this new science is able to explain a lot. It can explain falling objects. That was, you know, that was sort of what Galileo did. And... When you explain objects in motion without reference to free will, and it seems to be working out pretty well, some people might be worried that maybe it's going to describe us. You know, I'm, I'm holding these pens. Two pens, one highlighter, and a green Descartes book. Am I doing so by free will? The motion of the pens is not by free will, not by their free will. So how do I know the motion of my hands is by my free will? That's a question. Uh, that's an issue. We can begin to worry whether... Uh, this new science that seems to be explaining a lot of things pretty well without reference to free will, whether it might be able to explain everything. Do I say with or without? Uh, this new science is explaining a lot of things without reference to free will. We might start worrying, can it explain us without reference to free will? That's a problem. So you could think of it in these terms, and that's a problem that people like Descartes need to solve. You need to find an explanation for the human soul as not a physical thing that can still preserve free will or something like that. That's fine. You can think of the situation for modern science in these terms and you're, you're not too far off the mark, but there's, there's more that I want to try to explain. So, the best way to do this, I think, is just to illustrate it. Watch this here pen. Watch the pen. I'm holding it. I'm going to drop it. And behold, it falls. Now, what did you see? What do you think you saw, anyway? Here's another pen. It falls. Behold. Here's another pen. Be, uh, highlighter. Behold. It falls. I won't do it with the teacup. I don't want to kill my teacup. I'll risk dropping the Descartes book. It falls. And what did you see? What you saw, or what you thought you saw, was just chunks of matter obeying a couple of laws of physics. That's how we think now. You saw chunks of matter obeying the laws of physics. That's what you think happened. That is what you think is the whole of the event. There's just laws of physics and chunks of matter, and... There's no, there's no essence of the book or nature of the book that impels it to fall. There's no nature or essence of the pens and highlighter that causes them to fall. They're not obeying their own nature. They're not uh, fulfilling their own purpose in moving towards the center of the earth. What they're doing is just being chunks of matter that have to answer to the laws of physics. That's how we think now because we've been trained by modern science and post-Galileo physics. If you are familiar with the Galileo experiment, dropping things from the top of the tower, I believe, and tracking objects of different size, falling at the same pace, you're, you're actually really close to getting what's going on here. The modern sciences are considering matter, are considering physical objects as chunks of matter obeying the laws of physics. They're moving away from a physics where we consider physical objects as having inherent natures that compel them to do what they do. There's a lot more, but if you can just get that far, think of uh, this uh, scientific paradigm shift that happens with Galileo, where instead of thinking of objects as 
proceeding according to their own nature and their own proper function to move towards a state of rest closer to the center of the earth. If you stop thinking of them in these terms and start thinking of them as chunks of matter obeying the laws of physics, if you can understand that paradigm shift, that they stopped thinking in one way and started thinking in another, you're really close to understanding why the new science was a problem that a modern philosopher would want to solve, because it was reconsidering matter in these terms. Now, you might think, oh well, those silly medievals, those silly old-fashioned Christians, they were just stuck with their old theory in physics. Are you kidding? It wasn't that simple. It wasn't that they had some religious teaching that said, this is how physics works. No, no, no. They were thinking of us, of human beings, as things that have proper functions. They were thinking of human beings as things that have proper function. The proper function of a physical object includes falling towards the center of the earth. That's what it does until it, it meets some resistance. That is not just a chunk of matter obeying the laws of physics. This is a thing with a nature, an essence, and when it falls, it's following its nature. It's living, it's acting according to its nature. It's fulfilling its proper function. Now, the proper function of a, this object is to fall towards the center of the earth. What is the proper function of the human soul, as discussed in Augustine's Confessions, but to ascend upward to God? My, my soul's love is my weight, Latin pundus. And, oh, I can't remember the exact quote, unfortunately. My soul's love is my weight, he says, Augustine says in Confessions 13, if I remember correctly. And it pulls me up towards God. The soul has a proper function, to proceed towards rest in God. And this thing has a proper function, to proceed towards rest as close to the center of the earth as possible. And in general, the human being has a proper function, and this thing has a proper function because... This has an essence. It has a nature. Human beings have essences and natures. Now, you might think, well, couldn't the human being have a proper function and this just be a chunk of matter obeying the laws of physics? Well, you could think that, and maybe that's what Descartes wants to do. I think that's a pretty good way of thinking of what Descartes wants to do. He wants to let the new science have its new way of thinking of physical objects as chunk of matter obeying the laws of physics, not fulfilling a particular nature or anything like that. But think of human beings as having natures, because they're not just matter, they're also souls, and the souls have natures and proper functions. But matter doesn't have proper functions, it's just a chunk of matter, laws of physics, objects in motion. But there's still more. Here's, here's a better way of thinking of it. It's not easy to separate a physics that says these things are, uh, have natures that impel them to move towards the, the center of the earth until they meet some resistance. And... And... Um, I forgot how that sentence began. It's not easy to separate the physics that says these objects have natures that uh, impel them to move towards the center of the earth, and we have proper function to ascend to God, to love God and neighbor, to love our neighbors ourselves, to have the Aristotelian virtues of wisdom, courage, justice, and moderation, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. It's very difficult to say we can separate the physics of these things from the meta-ethics of humanity. Why? Because they're all the same. In pre-modern philosophy, the metaphysics of a human being and the physics of a falling object are part of the same metaphysics. It's the metaphysics we call hylomorphism. I've explained it on this channel and other, other places. Um, actually, I need to redo the cartoon by the time. Uh, Phil and Sophie. Phil and Sophie discuss hylomorphism. Um, it's the theory that this is not just a chunk of matter. It's a chunk of matter plus some non-physical form or nature or essence. Both of them are here. And what we think of as a physical object, if it were just matter, it would just be a pile of particles. Interestingly, modern philosophy has, a contemporary philosophy, has rediscovered this uh, picture of matter. According to which, if this is only matter, it doesn't even exist. We call that eliminativism. It's a theory in contemporary metaphysics. Hylomorphism agrees. If this is a chunk of, if this is only matter, then it can't even exist because there's no pen here. There's just the particles that make it up, according to a pure materialism. So, the pre-modern metaphysics says, yeah, that's right, and that's why this thing isn't matter only. This is matter plus immaterial form or nature or essence, and that's the metaphysics of hylomorphism. Things are matter plus form, nature, essence. Even this thing, even this teacup, this teacup, even rocks are not purely physical objects. They are matter plus form. And it's that 
non-physical aspect of them that makes physical objects uh, move towards the center of the Earth. The physics is part of the hylomorphous metaphysics. And the hylomorphous metaphysics explains us. We are also hylomorphs. We are matter plus non-physical soul. Um, not one and the other, and they're uh, next to each other. They never connect. Not one and the other, and they're mysteriously connected. Not one inside the other. And actually, in hylomorphism, it makes more sense to say uh, the body is inside the soul than to say that the soul is inside the body. Now, we are actually a combination, a mixture. We are both. This is the old metaphysics. It's Aristotle. It's Plato. It's Plotinus. It's Augustine. It's Aquinas. It's pretty much the whole pre-modern tradition, more or less. Uh, I'm probably oversimplified a bit. The, well, the Stoics and the Epicureans didn't think that, but it's the dominant medieval philosophy. And it's also in the major, the single, you know, not single, the two biggest uh, pre-modern philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, they're totally hydromorphous. All right, so, in the old metaphysics, the pre-modern metaphysics, the physics of falling objects is part of the same theory that describes human proper function, human ethics, and also human religion. Now, understand that from roughly Augustine until Aquinas, something like a thousand years, Christian thought has been integrating these ideas. So you can't easily separate the physics from the religion and the ethics. Descartes has to find a way to separate them, or some other way, to somehow make science work and keep the old religion. But the old religion has just spent thousand years, and that's a little oversimplified, <laughs> the old religion has just spent a thousand years combining this old school Aristotle style hylomorphous metaphysics with the religion. It's what Catholicism is. It's what Christianity is. This is this is this um, combination of Christian religion and hylomorphous metaphysics and proper functionalist ethics goes back on one side to uh, how far back do you take the Christian religion thing? As far as Moses, as far as David, certainly as far as Jesus and Paul. 2000, no, no, 1500, <laughs> 16, 1637 years. How far back? Well, if Jesus is born in 8 AD, do the math, but more or less that many years. How far back do you take the, the, the metaphysics and the ethics? Well, Plato, Aristotle, something like 350 BC or something. How far back do you take the explicit integration of them, I would think Augustine at the latest would be where you start this. This is European culture. This is European civilization. This is the Christian religion as Descartes knows it. There's no separation. They've been integrated, completely integrated from the from, from long before Descartes. So it's a big deal to think about separating them, which is the sort of thing Descartes has to try to figure out if he can do. But the problem, I hope, is now clearer. The new science is considering matter as objects, obeying the laws of physics, and that's it. And where does that leave us? That leaves us with an entire metaphysics in doubt. And with that metaphysics, every aspect of culture that has been shaped by the Christian theology that defied metaphysics. Sorry, the new science has defied the old metaphysics that has been inextricably bound to Christian theology for a thousand years, twelve hundred years, something like that. So, this is a big problem. It's not that science challenges uh, the religious view of whether one object rotates around another or vice versa. It's not like the big deal is that Earth revolving around Sun or vice versa is a threat to these stodgy old religious people who, who thought that their Bible was saying, no, the earth doesn't move, the sun must revolve around it. No, no. The bigger deal that Descartes sees is science has challenged our very understanding of what reality is. And with it, everything in religion, everything in culture, everything in Europe, everything in civilization, as Descartes knows it. All right. So... I should pause to mention, just as contemporary metaphysics 
has rediscovered the old Aristotelian idea that this thing, if it's just matter, doesn't actually exist. There's only its particles. It's just a pile of things. It's just stuff. It's not an actual pen. Just as contemporary metaphysics has rediscovered that idea, so contemporary metaphysics has also rediscovered Aristotelian hylomorphism, which has a number of contemporary representatives. Um, ask me to comment if you want a list of them, and maybe I'll do better. Off the top of my head, Edward Fieser is a hylomorphist. There's at least one example I can think of off the top of my head. Brandon Rickabaw. Rickabaw. Sorry if you ever watched this video. Rickabaw. Rickabaw. Can't remember if I'm supposed to say Rickabaw or Rickabaw. All right. Um, so, that's the problem. The new sciences have emerged, and the real problem is that it would force us, if we accept this picture of matter in motion, it would force us to reconsider the entirety of our conception of human beings, our conception of the universe, our conception of God, of religion, of culture, of civilization. Everything has been tied together for centuries. Indeed, at least one millennium. We've been tied together. This physics, uh, the old school physics that Galileo threatened with metaphysics, uh, with the, the old school hylomorphous metaphysics and with religion and religion with culture. So Descartes, I, I can't tell you for sure how many people saw this, saw this threat coming, but Descartes did. He's a brilliant enough philosopher to see that this new science threatens every dang thing. So he's got to find a way to fix it. Now, how do you possibly fix a problem like that? How can you possibly surgically remove these things that have been so closely integrated, that have been uh, in a situation where, there, where theologians and philosophers have been tying them together for a millennium or more? How do you separate those things? Well, they cart us a radical idea. That's part of what the method of doubt is about, I think. Eliminate all beliefs except one you cannot doubt, and then rebuild. And if it just so happens that you can rebuild beliefs in such a way that you can let the new science flourish and keep a whole bunch of the old religion, great. Go for it. And that's what Descartes does. He doubts everything, including the science and including the religion. But then he proves, I, ex I think, therefore, I exist, and therefore God exists with his clever argument for the existence of God which we could talk about another time. I don't think all that much of his initial argument. There are other arguments for the existence of God I, I don't want to rule out without thinking really carefully through them. Who knows, I might agree with them. Don't ask me right now. I'm trying to think about other things. Descartes clears away all beliefs, except the one he cannot doubt, I think, therefore I exist. And then he builds a new foundation for knowledge, existence of God, some beliefs we can call common sense beliefs, uh, the world outside my mind exists, my senses put me in contact with it, reason can be trusted, etc., etc. And on these first three layers of knowledge, he builds. And he builds, initially, this Cartesian dualism stuff. There's matter and there's mind. And so he really does have the chance to let science work over here with matter, and religion can work over here with minds. And while it is perhaps impossible to surgically remove these things, to surgically remove... Uh, the old physics from the old metaphysics that it was a part of, a, an integral part of, you can't surgically remove them. It was possible to eliminate everything and then rebuild just the right beliefs not connected to each other, just enough beliefs about soul and God to, to make the religion work, while also not having the old beliefs about physics, but something surprisingly conveniently close to Galileo. Now at this point, i gotta, I got to ask the question, if it works out this conveniently, is he lying? Is this just his philosophical solution to cultural problems? Is he facing these problems, the post-Reformation problem, the post-modern, not post-modern, the post-emergence of modern science problem, and the problem of scholastic philosophy just conveniently coming up with a new philosophy that fixes everything? And maybe he didn't mean a word of it. He's just trying to save civilization or some such. I suppose it's a possible interpretation of Descartes. I don't buy it. I, I don't see any need to call him a liar. I think he means it. I think he really means it. Now, it's possible he was motivated to find the right sort of philosophy that would solve all these problems. I think at any rate, uh, it's great that he does. I think that's what he's thinking. It's great that it works. And perhaps he was motivated to make it work. Now... What else shall I say about this? Um, I will say this. Well, I, I don't call Descartes a liar. I don't trust him either. <laughs> Descartes a shady guy. 
He's, he's amazing in what he does. Galileo now. Galileo says uh, stuff about the earth in motion, right? Earth revolves around the sun. It's not vice versa. Galileo gets in some trouble for this. Descartes, much more radically, when he gives his new metaphysics, says, even addressing it, he gives this Cartesian dualism, there's matter and there's mind and they don't connect. There's certainly no non-physical nature, no hylomorphism anymore. It's just chunks of matter in motion. Like Galileo says, Galileo is implicitly causing this revolution. But uh, in the, on the surface, it looks like Galileo is getting in trouble more for, um, more for the, the, matter, the earth in motion issue. Um, now I don't know the history of Galileo well enough. If I'm myself working with an oversimplified version of Galileo, that, uh, that should be reconsidered by all means. Reconsider what I say here. But uh, let me try to finish saying it now because I keep interrupting myself. Descartes outdoes Galileo. Galileo just says the Earth's in motion around the sun, not vice versa. But Descartes says something much more dramatic. Galileo just says, here's one physical object that does something a little different than we thought. And Descartes redefines every physical object in existence in a way completely inconsistent with traditional philosophy and Catholic religion. And holy cow, he got away with it. It's amazing. Descartes is a really uh, smooth political operator. I don't know how else to describe it. He's, he's very sneaky. He's very clever. He manages to say much more dramatic things than Galileo does, and he gets away with it. Of course, he was careful. He didn't publish one of his books uh, because having seen what happened to Galileo, he got nervous and reconsidered things. Part of what he does is say, look at me, I'm a Catholic. I, I mean it. For the record, I think he does mean it. I'm, I'm a serious Catholic. My, my concern with Descartes is not that he's lying when he says this. My concern is what he's doing when he says it, even if it's true. He says, look at me, I'm a good Catholic. I'm a real Christian. I'm serious about this. Look, I proved the existence of God. I proved the immortality of the soul. This is really beneficial to morality, to religion. And while he's saying this, me, good Catholic, prove the existence of God, prove the immortality of the soul. While he's saying this loudly, dramatically, with one hand, like some clever magician who distracts you, with his other hand, he's carefully removing the foundation of Catholic thought as we knew it by redefining, uh, redefining the world in terms of his... Uh, very different Cartesian metaphysics. His Cartesian dualism is a very different metaphysics from the metaphysics of Catholic philosophy and theology that preceded Descartes. All right, that's enough. That's enough. That is quite enough jabbering about Descartes. For now, I have no idea how many more uh, philosophy shorts videos I might do in the future. I'll see you later, I suppose. If you watch this far, let me know in comments. Thanks for watching.